So to just walk you through some of them. The first is the idea that a curve, as defined with calculus, is an infinitesimally subdivided system of line segments. Now, in this space right now, you get a repetition of bays, where every bay is the same, and they're all pointing to a center point. So it's an ideal geometry. It's, it's a reductive geometry. Um, for this building that I did uh, maybe six years ago in New York City, the, it's a Korean Presbyterian church. The idea was to make it have all the traits of a church, like this building, any of the traits of a church, to focus it towards an altar point, to bring light in from behind, to decay the, the view of detail towards the altar so your eye would lead there. All these traits, but I wanted to do it without doing a Latin cross or a basilica. And so here, what you see is a repetition of elements where every single panel of this interior is uniquely shaped and uniquely sized, but rhythmically they're unique in a continuous series. So there's a rhythm and a pattern of component to component, which like a calculus based curve, every single component is changing its size relative to every other one. It produces a single space uh, so that it's not fragmented but that single space is defined with a collection of elements where no two are the same. So, in architecture, this idea that all of the parts could be unique but still produce a whole is one of the things I'm after. Uh, this is a view of that same building from the exterior, where at a different scale you see these exterior components of this entry, uh, where every one of those elements changes in scale and shape. And again, looking the, the other direction, you also, this is a much more dynamic and animated architecture. You know, it's not an accident that this is generated with animation software. Um, and that quality of animation, you know, as it changes looking in this view versus looking in that view, the fact that every component is unique gives you a more dynamic sense of space. And this is something, you know, very characteristic of arguments about Baroque architecture. Okay, so, but, but simple variety is honestly the biggest problem, I think, in media and in design and in architecture right now. Um, is an example, you know, it seems like most people are from the States or Canada anyway, but it's this way all over the world now. I remember when I used to go buy a toothbrush, there were wood toothbrushes, a plastic toothbrush, and some other kind. About 10 years ago, the whole aisle of my supermarket is now filled with choices about toothbrushes. And out of curiosity, I started to look around and see, are there conferences of toothbrush designers? Is there, you know, are there hot toothbrush designers? Are there people doing interesting things with materials? <laughs> it's just a mindless, it's just mindless variation. You know, there's a need for newness, and so there's high-velocity design, but there's no logic to it. There's no theory of it. There's no structure. So I wouldn't want to suggest that using calculus and using digital tools for construction just means more variety, because actually the last thing I think we need is more variety. And that's why this, the difference between variation, which is repetition with variation, versus just simple variety is a big problem. Why architecture is a good place to think about that is you almost always make a whole. So the relationship of the part and the whole modulating in unison um, is an interesting problem. This embryological house project came up because I was invited by Volvo to come talk to them and I didn't know why and I went up, I was in Sweden and met with the head of design at Volvo and he said, this is now seven, eight years ago. He said, well, you know, we don't use tools as much anymore, and all of our machines are on wheels, and they reconfigure in the factory, and we'll build two cars of one model, and then three more cars of another model, so it's not like they build special factories for each car. And they said, in the near future, we could make every car one of a kind. But the problem is, our car designers take 18 months to design a car, no matter what, and the dealers that sell the cars 
aren't ready to design a custom car, so we need architects. We want car architects, and we want you to tell us how to do what you do, which is make all buildings different using standard mass-produced parts. And all of the architects there just thought, oh my god, no. Thank, you know, we, they were giving us more credit than we deserved, but they were pointing to something that in fact we had the knowledge to do, we just never bothered to think about it. So this embryological house was a kind of my first attempt at an industrial design model of architecture, like this Volvo model. And I actually went to Alberti's definition of the ideal villa, where he said that it's, uh, the ideal villa is a house where no part could be added or subtracted without violating the perfection of the whole. And I thought, how interesting. So I said, a list of 2,048 parts to build a house. And I put all 2,000 parts into a program where they would all relate to one another. So any change in one part would distribute and change all of the other parts in unison. And started to go around to the aeronautics and automobile industries and find out how to fabricate an entire house using robotic production methods, where these 2,048 parts could change in unison and be fed directly into a computer program. And I got various grant money and used this for exhibitions and things and basically went through the architectural process of designing the interface for these volumes and designing the software that would write the code for sending these things to the various machines. And it's when I bought one of these machines from my office and started fabricating them at various scales. So these things, you know, they're the size of a you know, basketball or a soccer ball. And these are three variations of an endless number of variations. We made you know, tens of thousands of these that are at the CCA now. All of those parts came off of these molds. So every part, every panel is fabricated off of one of those sheets and we just vacuum formed uh, skin on them. And we started to scale this process up. So all of those panels in the assembled volume came from those different sheets that you see it resting on. And we kept scaling this up, you know, using automobile prototypers and aerospace manufacturers and kept making these variations bigger and bigger and bigger to get them to the scale of architecture. Now, this had no client. It was a pure research and development uh, initiative of mine. But it spun off in, in different ways. But the key problem here was how to build a system out of components where the components would always be connected and informing one another as to their position in space and their shape. Okay, so another, this is a, I mean, Derrida picked it up. It's a, it's a term from antiquity. I mean, Heraclitus used this term of the separatrix. But the separatrix is a curve which both connects and it unites and differentiates two systems. So a separatrix would be, say, the coastline. You know, the coast is the thing that connects the land to the water. It doesn't belong to either one. It doesn't come first. Um, it's a discrete line but it's a discrete line which is defined by two systems interacting with each other. So this idea of separatrix connections was the first time I started to think through curvature in a structural manner. So to give you an example of a separatrix working at the scale of a building mass, this is a... a 24 art studios and 48 uh, apartments in Valencia, Spain. And they all surround a kind of central exhibition court and outdoor work area. 